hello, and I'm one of the reference librarians here. We're so happy that you're able to join us at our first conversations on social issues of fall quarter 2016. How many folks have been here before? The COSI, right? Not just the library. I hope you've all been to the library. But the COSI. All right, so it looks like we have some returners, and we also have some new folks. So we're very proud to host this series in the library because we see it as a natural extension of our charge to promote the freedom of information and open exchange of ideas. So whether or not you agree with everything you hear in a COSI or everything you read in the books on our shelves, we want you to have access to a variety of perspectives and viewpoints so that we can learn from each other. Okay. So we have students, faculty, staff, community members come and hold and facilitate these. And so if you are passionate about a topic and you would like a space to have conversation with your community members here at Central, please come talk to me so we can get you on the winter schedule. Right. So, at the end of this, I'll ask you to fill in a brief survey asking what you liked, how we can improve, um, and suggestions for future sessions. You'll notice there are some books along the whiteboard and on that standing podium. You're able to check any of those out, so if you're interested in learning more about the topics that are discussed here today, we have some resources for you. You can also go to the library's reference desk and ask us for some help finding additional sources. Talk louder. Oh yeah. Well, I just wanted to mention too that we're recording this, so we just want to make a, a make it more clear uh, to everyone that we we are recording and we'll, we post them on YouTube. So um, if for whatever reason you have to leave early, you're always welcome to come check out the talk there. Yeah, we know that there are lots of folks who would like to be here and aren't necessarily able to make it, so we want to make the content available to them. Next week in Broadway Performance Hall, we'll have four local candidates um, running in the current election on hand to discuss the issues that are important to you. You can ask them questions, get their perspective so that you can make an informed vote if and when you vote. But this week, I am so proud to welcome educator, writer, editor, community organizer, and author of Seattle's Indigenous Peoples Day Resolution, Matt Redmay. Chante Waste and Napet Yuse Pelo, Wakia Wanatan and Machia Pelo, Yan Moslaha and Matahan Yalo, Charles Remley Ate Wayet, Donna Harrison Dina Wayet, Tokashila Wakantata and Petu Kile Woke La Tanka, Tokashila Wakantata and Petu Kile Woaste Yoha Tokashila, Atokashila Wakantaka, then at the Wamash Mokoche King Wopila, and at the Wamash Oyate King Owichak Yar for Tokashila, Atokashila. Kimberly Wopila Tampa Tokashila. Well, good afternoon. My English name is Matt Renley. My Lakota name is Wakia Wa'anatan. I come from Standing Rock, though I live here in Seattle. Um, Papa Lakota, they're uh, one of seven bands of the Lakota Nation. And I first and foremost like to give thanks and acknowledgement to the Duwamish peoples uh, for allowing me to be here as a guest in their homelands. Uh, we're taught as Native peoples that no matter where you go throughout the world, you always give uh, recognition and to the indigenous peoples of that land. I'd like to thank Kimberly for inviting me to come speak here today, and all of you for uh, coming to me and uh, learn, one, to learn a little bit more about Indigenous Peoples Day, as well as some of the uh, organizing efforts that we've been involved with uh, through uh, Lastro Indians, and uh, native media and stuff like that. And uh, I'm just gonna do a quick little song and then we'll jump right into some, uh, some material. <laughs> Oh, yeah. 
is because uh, that doctrine became the legal basis for the entire theft of uh, not only the United States, but all of North America, Central, South America. This was used as the legal justification. The doctrine of discovery was used as a legal justification to steal all of these lands, including the land right here in Seattle. Because what it says is because we are uh, uh, not considered human, uh, <coughs> that they had the right to claim that land. And not just, uh, <coughs> in, in, in the 1800s, uh, there was a Supreme Court case, uh, Johnson v. McIntosh, and in that Supreme Court case, it was stated that uh, European Christians, now white Americans, had the right to this land not because of conquest, because that's a, a huge myth out there. There were actually very few uh, military campaigns between Native peoples in the United States. And so it, they had the right to land not because of conquest, but by right of discovery, which is absolutely ridiculous. You know, I haven't been up in this college much, so it'd be like me walking up in here and saying, you, none of you are all Lakota, so I claim this on behalf of Lakota Nation. And, well, I'm sorry, I might be some Lakotas in here, but you know what I mean? So that, that is basically the mindset, and it was put in uh, to U.S. law via the Supreme Court, and that law is still on books. So that's the legal justification for the, our entire land theft. And so Columbus sailed under that, and that was used by other <coughs> European uh, colonizing nations uh, wherever they went out. So. That's the efforts to abolish Columbus Day are not to only uh, raise the serious concern that we shouldn't be celebrating a day of, of a man who committed mass genocide, but it's also a holiday that celebrates uh, colonialism. You know, because here we live in a, a settler colonial society. Okay, uh, so there's a settler colonialism. It's not uh, uh, meaning that the colonizers came here and stayed here unlike other places where they might have colonized but eventually went back to Europe. There's a difference. And so it's a holiday that, that celebrates uh, colonialism and that's really what we continue to fight to this day is, is uh, campaigns of colonization. We'll talk about some of the, the campaigns that we're working on, uh, including against some oil pipelines and stuff like that back in my homelands. So first I'll just share a quick little video and um, talks a little bit about the indigenous peoples they can be. <laughs> This man and what he did was a good thing. We have always disagreed with that. It's so important to recognize that Columbus was not a hero. If you look at things like United States history, there's nothing mentioned about indigenous people and the reality of what happened. And we got to look at things like, well, why are, are some of our young Native students not being successful? Are they being taught? the truth and do they want to be successful. We've been beaten down so much by these different institutions, educational system being one of them. And here you have a federal holiday recognizing a man who committed genocide. And uh, you know, we got it's like taking it on the chin every year, you know, how to put up with this uh, sort of um, those ideologies. 
So why change the name to Indigenous people to say we're giving recognition and acknowledgement and of the work our parents' generation uh, were involved with. Indigenous people say was an outgrowth of American Indian Movement and International Indian Treaty Council who came together and uh, said we're going to go to the United Nations and we're going to seek the change of Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Four or five years ago, I worked with affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians, a body that has 58 tribes from Alaska, Washington, Idaho, Oregon, Northern California, Western Montana, tribal interests represented. They passed a resolution calling on the abolishment of Columbus Day to replace with Indigenous Peoples Day. We have tried to get the city council, but never found any council members who were willing to, to sponsor the resolution until last year. I reached out to city council, because Shamasa wants yeah. office, got back from him, and actually was heard and said, hey, this is absolutely going to be something we will sponsor. You write the resolution, and I'll, I'll sponsor it. Wait, so I drafted the resolution, sent it out to other members in the native community to give voice and input and edit and that, those sort of things. In September of last year, we put a call out for people to show up to City Hall, bring your drums, so you're able to give some testimony. Tribal people were able to come together and think about what could be addressed with renaming that day from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. And I think that's an empowering process that folks are able to begin to express themselves and have their voices heard to strengthen the community ties. Um, I think that whole process was about unifying the community and, and also building allies you know, with the non-native communities. We didn't just go to the Seattle City Council to get them. We also went to the Seattle School Board and asked them to change it to Indigenous Peoples Day. And so a week before we got the Seattle City Council to vote on that resolution, the Seattle School Board actually passed it. And so if you open up your Seattle Public Schools calendar, you'll see the second Monday this as Indigenous Peoples Day. I'm really proud of that. And they're still, they're celebrated and the part that they'll get to play um, in the future. So to this day, Columbus Day is being celebrated in the city. For longer than that, my relatives have been desperately having terrible experiences in the streets as homeless native people. They have disappeared without anyone even knowing. But the reality of the situation is that a lot of indigenous people uh, can't even afford to live in the city limits of, of Seattle. Many of our homeless people who are native who live in the streets of Seattle feel very invisible, feel very disconnected, feel that the average people in the city um, don't like them, don't want to see them, don't want to be involved with them, wish that they weren't even there. And getting pushed out to um, further places like uh, I live in Sita, for instance, and there's a lot of folks in the area and, and you know, uh, areas surrounding Seattle. And I think that the passing of Indigenous Peoples Day is a recognition. I hope that when um, you know, as this becomes our mainstream idea of the city, Indigenous Peoples Day, we're celebrating that day, that when someone sees a Native person, that they're going to think about um, the Indigenous history of this country, and they're going to remember the genocide, the relocations, the reservation system, the boarding school systems, and they're going to remember all that um, historical, generational trauma and the current trauma that people are experiencing. To take care uh, of this resolution, uh, is the calling on the Seattle Public Schools to uh, fully implement uh, the guidelines of Hospital 1495, which seeks to implement the tribal sovereignty. One, one of the things we wrote into the resolution was the city council to call on the Seattle Public Schools to formally adopt and mandate the teaching of the Sense of Time and Memory tribal sovereignty curriculum. Schools were encouraged to um, teach about tribal culture, culture, history, and government. In 2015, that, that law was revised to requiring um, schools to teach about tribal culture, history, and government. That was a big piece that we wanted. Schools is where we're getting the incorrect information. 
is an opportunity to provide correct information. I think that for many years, I think the indigenous voice has been missing, and I think that there are elders and our young people that have answers to many of the world's problems, and that, that this is indigenous, acknowledging Indigenous Peoples Day is just the first step of making something very wrong very right. I would hope that with the implementation of since the time of memorial curriculum that it will provide indigenous students with a sense of pride. One of the more important parts that I've seen come out of this resolution was a sense of voice and empowerment that was shared with a broad spectrum of native peoples. My kids are going to experience a new story. That they were there last year at City Hall when they signed the proclamation and they saw this new, this new story of Indigenous Peoples Day and feeling proud of who they are and not feeling like they have to not hold back and not share that. All of Seattle community has an opportunity to dialogue about the history of this country. It just allows the community to grow as a society to address the realities of our history. And I think um, that's a really positive thing for, for the community. So that's how the resolution got passed, um, but we said, you know, we're not really done there, and uh, we're not only about celebrating, but pushing uh, uh, issues further. Uh, because across this country, as Native peoples, we're pretty invisible. Uh, whether it is in the schools, the media, pretty much any any uh, institution. But the reality is, as Native folks, is uh, we tend to be uh, the, the, the highest when it comes to issues like poverty, unemployment. Where I'm from, in Standing Rock, we actually have an 80 percent unemployment rate, 70 80 percent unemployment rate. Which, you know, when that recession hit and they're talking about a 14% unemployment rate, you know, that's like, that's a dream right there, having a 14% unemployment rate. But, uh, you know, Pine Ridge, which is uh, in Crow Creek and some of our other Bacota Dakota reservations have uh, similar unemployment rates at 80 to 90%. And even out here, there's this kind of misbelief amongst uh, non native populations that some of our gaming tribes like Tulalips, Muckleshoots, and Callips because they have these uh, fancy casinos that they must be doing so well and are being paid such uh, hyper capitas. But uh, a lot of those reservations still have uh, unemployment rates that hover around 40 to 50 percent. And that's despite having some of the gaming opportunities. I mean, that's helped knock it down considerably, but, but nowhere near other uh, demographics. So last year, what we uh, decided to do on the anniversary of Indigenous Peoples Day was uh, one of the campaigns that I've been involved with over a number of years is uh, to try to press Congress to enter into reconcili uh, truth and reconciliation with Native peoples over the boarding school era. And for those who aren't familiar with the boarding school era, uh, what, what that was, the any boarding school era, in the late mid late 1800s, uh, the United States government developed a policy where they said that it was um, a law for any Indian child uh, between the ages of 3, 4, up until 18, 19 to be taken from their homelands and placed in uh, government-run but church-sponsored uh, boarding schools where it was uh, the, the guy who, who started it, his name was uh, Pratt, Richard Pratt, and uh, he's actually the, the, the founder of the entire uh, mass prison incarceration movement. Uh, he started that in Florida when they began shipping uh, primarily Apaches uh, to Florida to, to mass incarcerate them. So he's kind of the father of that as well. Uh, but anyways, his, his slogan for any boarding schools was to kill the Indian to save the man. And so what these boarding schools did, uh, obviously why I'm speaking English now, primarily as my first language, is uh, our languages were, were outlawed. We were not allowed to speak our languages. Uh, you could only speak English. Our, uh, at that time, our traditional ceremonies were outlawed. Uh, they were criminalized. And if you were engaged in your traditional ceremonies, or your traditional spirituality, you uh, would be arrested for it. 
So our languages were criminalized, our spirituality was criminalized. Uh, the first thing they would have done to me is shave my hair off. Uh, they actually, if you read some of their old documents, uh, talk about uh, native men, native boys uh, having long hair was it symbolic of their connection to the devil. I ain't making that stuff up, they truly believe that. And uh, so did these boarding schools ran, you know, up from the late 1800s all the way to the 1970s. And uh, again, you had no choice. Uh, these uh, uh, Indian agents, they call them Indian agents, would come to your home and take your child. And if you resisted your child being taken away, you too would be uh, arrested. There's a um, kind of famous story now, history of uh, Hopis. They're kind of located, their tribe located in the Southwest. And a lot of the Hopis' uh, parents resisted these Indian agents coming in to take their children. And the parents would be arrested and actually taken out to Alcatraz Island with hardened criminals because they didn't want their children stolen and put in these boarding schools. Uh, at these boarding schools, not only did assimilation happen, but there was, and I apologize to young folks in here, but uh, you know there was, there was mass rape, there was mass sexual abuse. Some estimates are up to 90% of all the Indian boys and girls that were in the boarding schools were uh, sexually violated while in the boarding schools, uh, as well as mass deaths. Uh, a lot of the old boarding schools you can find, and we have found, uh, uh, mass burial graves um, net near them because of how many people died from either malnutrition, being beat to death. Uh, a lot of the priests uh, from raping Native women uh, would force the uh, fetuses uh, aborted, and you know, them children were buried out there. So this happened for roughly over 100 something years, and uh, Canada. Uh, copied it, um, uh, Australia copied it, and other other settler colonial societies uh, copied the, the U.S. boarding school policies and implemented it in their countries. Um, Canada actually acknowledged and apologized for, uh, the, up there they call them residential schools, they, and they have been engaged in a, a truth and reconciliation with the First Nations people up there. And so, Anyways, uh, down here we've been trying to press Congress into a, a similar, uh, uh, to doing similar to what Canada is doing. And to this day, they refuse to even acknowledge the, the boarding school era. I'm, I'm sure the vast majority of the people in this room have probably never even heard of any boarding schools. And uh, so anyways, uh, there's been a, a, a campaign led primarily by tribes uh, to press uh, the issue on a federal level. And um, last year we decided, well, let's use Indigenous Peoples Day as a platform to see if we can get uh, at least one non-tribal government to uh, be in solidarity and support with us. And so we drafted up another resolution to bring to the city council and to the mayor that they would uh, acknowledge the, the, the trauma and historical trauma that was, and, and we're talking 1970, I was born in, 1977, so this is my parents' generation were the last to, uh, to go through the, the boarding schools. And one other thing, uh, with that, uh, back to that crim criminalization of spirituality, when I was born, I was born 1977, when I was born, our spirituality was still criminalized in this country. It was in 1978 that there was a passage of, uh, uh, they call it Native American Religious Freedom Act, which essentially decriminalized our spirituality. So within my lifetime, you know, this policy still existed. So anyways, we drafted this resolution and we brought it to the, the city council. I had uh, asked them to, to support the work that tribes are already doing and become the first non-tribal government to call on Congress to uh, pass, uh, engage in truth and reconciliation. And they did. So we got, uh, last year we got the city council to pass that resolution. Uh, supporting tribal governments. And so I'm just going to show a little clip from last year, since so about a minute or so. This is more of a, a celebration march, because the other thing is celebrating our, our beautiful, diverse, indigenous cultures. This is last year. <laughs>
six other cities have joined us in making today Indigenous Peoples Day. Indigenous Peoples Day is a recognition of Indigenous people, but it is also a correction of revisionist history. It is a rejection of Columbus Day. Just a little sound. Um, so when we started back in 2014, there was just two uh, jurisdictions, local jurisdictions that had uh, didn't recognize Columbus Day, and that was Berkeley down in California. Uh, they were actually the first and only at that time to have an Indigenous Peoples Day, and they had passed that back in 1992, which was the 500 year anniversary of the Columbus uh, voyage. And then the, actually, ironically, the state of South Dakota, and uh, they have uh, what's called Native American Day. So that was the only two pre uh, 2014, and in 2014, Seattle and Minneapolis passed Indigenous Peoples res uh, resolutions, and since then, um, we're up to like 30 different cities and, and, and the, type of the state of Alaska who have passed resolutions. So one of the ideas is we, we had no luck on the federal level getting the, the federal government to uh, change, uh, get rid of Columbus Day, so we decided to take it to a, a more grassroots Effort. So that's why you've seen a lot of these cities and states all organizing these campaigns on the, on the local level. So this year, uh, this mon uh, Monday, um, we, we again want to continue pressing issues uh, related to Native peoples. And so uh, we brought up an issue that I've been near close to me and uh, I've been working on for a while, and that's around the Dakota Access Pipeline. And the Dakota Access Pipeline uh, is a 1,200 mile uh, pipeline, oil pipeline that runs from the Bakken oil fields in northwestern part of North Dakota across four states and into Illinois, where it connects with the uh, distribution hub and then goes down to the Gulf Coast for refinement and to be exported. Uh, along its way, uh, it crosses our treaty lands uh, as uh, in Standing Rock, and in particular, it crosses straight through old burial sites of cultural and sacred historical sites, uh, as well as going drilling and going directly underneath uh, the Missouri River. And the Missouri River is our uh, source of water. Not only our source of water, but it actually provides water for roughly 10 million people between North Dakota all the way down to uh, St. Louis, our individuals who really, uh, get their, their water from the Missouri River. And so, uh, we have been um, fighting the Keystone XL pipeline, and uh, this, is, this, this pipeline kind of took a little bit of a, a backseat, in, at least in terms of media, uh, for a while, but we've actually been uh, actively fighting that pipeline since 2014. So when we talk about native media, um, like I said, one of my roles is as editor and writer with Last Real Indians, and so um, a number of months ago, or oh, years ago, uh, my aunt, LaDonna Grable, Alex gave me a call and said, nephew, I'm, I'm really concerned that it looks like they're gonna approve all the permits for this pipeline. You know, I know you're acting in Seattle, but can you help out? And so I just started to, to research about this pipeline, uh, what it was gonna do and the impacts it was gonna have. And at that time, there was literally nothing about the Dakota Access Pipeline in any media except for some very, uh, you know, like you're looking in the Bismarck Tribune or something like that. And, uh, in, and uh, they would have articles that were just basically like, uh, yeah, this pipeline's coming in, but nothing that really addressed the impacts that uh, this pipeline was gonna have. And so uh, we just started writing about it. And uh, when, at that time, one of our primary concerns was that uh, Energy Transfer, the company behind the Code Access Pipeline, wasn't engaging in consultation with the tribes as they're required to do by federal law and by our treaty rights. So one of the things we've been doing the whole time around this pipeline is we're simply asking that these government agencies and the, the company follow their own laws. Okay? We're asking them to follow their own laws. We ain't asking for no special treatment to tell them to follow their own laws, which they've been violating. And uh, this, this company has been laying this pipe for uh, about, I want to say in April is when they started laying the pipe the, um, in the different states. 
and they don't, to this day they still don't have all their permits necessary to build this pipeline, but they've been going through with it. So on April 1st, uh, uh, folks from Standing Rock, other Lakota Dakotas, uh, made a decision to establish um, a spirit camp, that's what it was called at that time, and um, we had a, a ride, a horse ride from our from Fort Gates on Standing Rock up north into Cannonball, where the pipeline was going to go through. And they set the teepees up and uh, right in the direct path of this pipeline and become a physical barrier to stopping it. Uh, and then in August, a little before that, uh, we had some youth. Our youth have had us played a very primary role in this campaign. They uh, have held two major runs, literally running. Uh, first was from Cannonball, North Dakota, down to uh, uh, Des Moines, Iowa, uh, where the Army headquarters, Army Corps of Engineers was headquarters to raise the issue to them. They weren't heard. And then they ran from Cannonball uh, to Washington, D.C. Literally, and I'm not talking like in a car or nothing, I mean like literally running. And uh, it took them a little over a month to do that. And then when they got there, they went to the White House to demand that, uh, again, the federal government, the president, uh, uh, engage with tribes, honor and respect treaty rights, and stop this, this pipeline. Uh, and they were, again, kind of ignored and uh, brushed aside. And in fact, with the comment that came back to them was, well, how many um, tribes are actually concerned about this pipeline? Is it just standing on? So the youth brought that message back and so we decided, uh, well, we're going to show them exactly how many peoples are concerned about this pipeline. So we began outreaching to uh, sites like Last Real Indian and other places to call on other tribal governments to stand in solidarity with Standing Rock. And within six days, we got nearly 100 tribal governments to pass resolutions in support. To this day, it's over 300. Who have, and there's 500 tribes in, uh, in, within the, the, the U.S and uh, who have signed on in support. And that camp, that original sacred stone camp, blossomed from 30, 40 people to uh, right now there's close to 8,000 people from literally all over the world who have come to Cannonball on the Standing Rock, uh, on, our, on a reservation to uh, form a blockade to stop the pipeline where there's been mass direct actions, uh, locking down of equipment and stuff like that taking place. And again, to this day, there's been a virtual media blackout uh, from the mainstream media, which is why we, one of the reasons we started Ask Me in the first place, you know, my, my buddy Chase Iron Eyes, he's the one that came up with the idea, and it was simply like, man, we're sick and tired of, you know, trying to knock on the door of mainstream media to cover our issues. I mean, it, that, that game's getting kind of old. And besides, we, you know, the best ones to tell their own stories is us. So we don't need to be, even if they do cover our issue, they're probably going to get it wrong anyways. And so Last Real Indians was established as a place to get platform for Native peoples to, to write about and uh, expose and address issues impacting their tribal communities. And, uh, you know, Dakota Access Pipeline is, is one of those examples. We also first was to expose the Keystone XL Pipeline out here. You know, I've worked with uh, the Lummi, um, who, uh, who actually stopped. Uh, what was proposed to be North America's largest coal export terminal to be placed on their land, actually on their, their bar one of their coal burial sites, and right now working with the Punalts out on the coast of, uh, uh, down past Olympia out on the coast to stop a Bakken and tar sands uh, train to refinement export terminal that would go on their lands. So that, that's one of the impacts of, of native media is uh, we have the ability, we have the agency and, uh, to tell our own stories. And uh, that's what we've been utilizing, you know, to, to talk about these different issues. And, um, you know, and it's, it's been pretty horrific, some of the things that have been happening back there. Some might have been familiar back in August when a private security firm was hired to uh, protect the pipeline. And uh, they brought in German Shepherds and other dogs. And I don't know if some people saw the videos of that, but they, they released their dogs on the people who were praying, sending their praying, seeing the stones like I was doing earlier. And they, they got caught because Amy Goodman from Democracy Now! happened to be staying in the camp at that time. And her and her film crew went out there and documented what these 
uh, private security guards were doing. And because of doing this, uh, the state of North Dakota actually issued an arrest warrant for Amy Gooden. And that should be a concern of anybody who uh, has, uh, you know, cares about freedom of speech, freedom of the press. Uh, they've issued her a, a warrant for her arrest because she was uh, out there filming what happened. So we, that's a, a kind of a current issue that we're, we're fighting is the Code Access Pipeline. But you, you've seen a, a, a really beautiful movement of indigenous folks and non-Indian people too coming out there. I mean, we have people from the, the Sami people. The Sami are the indigenous peoples of, of Europe in the, in the Nordic area. And uh, they have come out and stand in solidarity with us. And um, back in their homelands, they face a lot of similar issues that we face. We've had a lot of tribes from, indigenous tribes from uh, the Amazon and other places in South America who have ventured out and are staying with us. Uh, a lot of Aztecs, stuff like that. So a lot of beautiful things are happening. And what we are grounded in is that we're not, um, you know, protesters, we're not activists. Uh, we're none of that. We're, we're protectors. And what we're protecting is our children. We're protecting our sacred sites. And one thing with that sacred sites, that, that's just a different way of saying where we go to pray. You know, uh, just, you know, we don't, we don't go and pray in a, you know, a, a room like this, right? But that doesn't make it less sacred or less valuable than somebody else's church or synagogue or temple. You know, would I like, we like to say, you know, if, if a bulldozer was showing up to where you go pray, was a temple, a synagogue, and bulldozing it, you would have the right to be pretty like pissed off. One, it probably wouldn't happen because people would be uh, up in arms over it, but that's exactly what's happening to, uh, uh, well, I'll take questions in about five minutes. Uh, and right now is our places, our, our, our burial, and our, as well as burial sites. You know, uh, we, we're telling them our people are buried here, and they're still going through with their bulldozers, <coughs> smashing up our ancestors. You know, if, I'm sure uh, wherever your grandparents may be laid to rest, your great grandparents, you know, if that was happening to your ancestors, you too would be pretty pissed off. You know, so we're, that, these are the type of things that we're fighting. And with the protection, we're talking about that water. You know, every every living being on Earth needs water to live. You know, and uh, in our Lakota language, we call it mini bichoni, and uh, the ni part n i, but that translates to is life. And when you put the m in front of it, it means it's for referencing yourself. It gives me life. So mini literally means it gives me life. You know, that's what we call it. It's not water, H2O, and that gives me life. And when we put that Wichoni on the end of it, that Wichoni is in reference to all living creation. So when we say mini Wichoni, it's to get recognition that all life needs this to live. So that's what we're fighting and protecting. So, uh, listen, I could take some, some questions. I just wanted to say that a lot of people end up leaving at five. And to the hour. Oh, okay. <laughs> so if you have questions, um, I want to be sure you have a chance to ask. You can ask anything. You don't even have to relate to this. Um, it could be about other topics. Uh, what, do you, what is the plan for Indigenous People's Day on Monday? Are there any public yeah, events? Yeah, we actually have a full day of activity scheduled. Um, oh, wow, I even got on that whole thing about the pipeline. So we've got mm -hmm. the uh, council to pass a resolution and support. So Monday's... Indigenous Peoples Day is being done in solidarity with Standing Rock. Uh, so at 10 a.m. we'll hold that, like that march you saw, uh, we'll go from a celebration march from Westlake to uh, Seattle City Hall. And down at Seattle City Hall, they're going to bring in this guy right here, Sharon Alexi. He's going to be doing a, uh, a talk down there. And then in the evening at a uh, Daybreak Star. Um, anybody been to Daybreak Star before? So, uh, you know, speaking of social issues, I mean, this is an important issue to know. In the 1960s, American Indian Movement and others, they, that used to be an old military base. Uh, it's called Fort Lawton. It's in Magnolia. And Native peoples uh, scaled the fences and occupied it to uh, establish an Indian cultural center. And so, uh, and they won. They were successful after uh, 
uh, many attempts and many beatings uh, by the military police and other folks. And, uh, but anyways, you say that history because it's local history. So we're having an evening celebration out there where there'll be uh, traditional <coughs> singing, dancing, and, and stuff like that. Last year we had uh, Aztecs come up and, and perform. Uh, this year some Native Hawaiians are coming out to uh, share some. And it's all, uh, everything's free. So you can come to one, you can come to all. If you go to a, um, Daybreak Stars Facebook page and their event, you can get a link to all the activities that are taking place. Yeah, yeah. What are the schools like in the reservation? Um, high school, high school. Are you good? Are you well funded? No, not well funded at all. Uh, which again is one of the things that goes back to treaty rights. Uh, so in, a, in most treaties that tribes entered in with the United States government, they're one of the, the things would always be about the right to education. And to this day, they've uh, never fully funded our schools, so I mean they're pretty. A lot of them are, are pretty run down. But in the past few years, you've seen a, a movement by some tribes to just take control of uh, of their own tribal schools and get get the U.S. government out and get all them out and say, you ain't funding this uh, fully anyways. And you know, you know, we might not have the funds to do it. We're going to take full control of it. So there's been some good movement along those lines. Feel free to ask anything. Uh, I think we should show our support for the people at San Diego. Um, yeah, if you go to um, this page here, uh, we've been posting a lot of uh, ways to support. And not all of them are financial. I mean, that's just some of the things. Uh, especially going towards legal fees, but uh, there, there's other things. We've got them all spelled out and some of the things on there. Do you think how we vote will have an impact on the pipeline? Um, in one way, we, so, we, so one, uh, one of the successful campaigns we had was a multi-year campaign to stop the Excel Excel pipeline, which was running from the tar sands in Canada all the way down to the Gulf Coast. And, uh, and we won when uh, Obama vetoed, uh, not vetoed, but struck down the permit for this uh, Trump has come out and said that if he's elected one person, he's going to do is reverse that and approve the Keystone Pipeline. Previously, Clinton has said that she was opposed to it, but you know, who knows? So. Are there any other cities um, or, or urban entities in the state of Washington that have passed? Yeah, so uh, actually, as of yesterday, there's now five. So after Seattle passed it, Bellingham, Olympia, Spokane, and two days ago, Yakima passed resolutions. And I've had the opportunity to work with all those folks. Some other uh, uh, misbeliefs I always like to throw out there we don't get government checks, we don't get free education, obviously, you know, we pay taxes just like everybody else. So. Any support we do get comes from our tribes. Is there any uh, international recognition of the people so far? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. Can you tell us a little bit about your tribe? Uh, so Lakota Nation, where uh, our traditional homelands are in what is now the states of North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Nebraska, and into eastern Montana. Uh, there's seven bands of the Lakota Nation. Uh, we call it, in our language, Ocheti Shakumi, the seven council fires. And I'm with Papa Lakota, and uh, we're, we're the most northern band uh, of the Lakota Nation. And speaking of treaties and stuff, and us and our history, we actually got ours because... Uh, Is it right down? Oh, sure. Uh, we, we went to war with the United States. In uh, 1866, we declared war against the United States. It was called Red Cloud's War, and uh, we defeated the United States militarily, and they entered into a treaty agreement with us, a peace treaty, and uh, that's how we retain our homeland. So, you know, I like to throw that out there because another myth is that tribes were militarily conquered and stuff like that. It's, it's not true. So, uh, we're the ones that wiped out Custer and stuff like that. What did you want to try? Uh, Lakota. Oh, sure. <laughs> And maybe your band. Mm -hmm. well, the 
what that translates to is allies or equal peace. What well, Papa translates to is those, when all seven bands would come together, we put our teepees around the, the perimeter of the spirit of protectors. I hate to interrupt. I want to take this time to thank Matt. So please join me in thank you.